Praise the Lord, everyone. God bless you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Garden of Peace Worship Center. Amen, amen, amen. We are live tonight. Amen. Live uh, in our, uh, what we're working on as a studio. We're, we're thankful to God, amen, that you're with us. Uh, we're going to have a great time in the Lord. I pray you are blessed. And uh, we want to pray, Father God, we thank you, bless you, magnify you. Lord, let the words of our heart and the meditation, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, our King and our Redeemer. And God, we praise you and magnify you. We just lift up the name of Jesus, that name that is above every name. Hallelujah, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're excited tonight because uh, it's awesome that uh, a feast day actually falls on a Wednesday and we're able to, amen, address it on the day that it falls. And so today we are talking about Rosh Hashanah and uh, we're talking about the Feast of Trumpets. And I, I think what's, you know, I, I tell you, it was interesting. I remember when I was going to uh, L.A. City College. And so the first, now, the, the, I did not know this, you know, uh, Rosh Hashanah actually fell at that time, you know, because the, the way the, the uh, Jewish people, you know, date their, you know, and of course they have 30 days, you know, they don't have, you know, they have a couple of changes, but... They have 30 days, period. Not like, of course, the English, you know, which we have 30 days, have September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31. Now, ours are different. Then you got the leap year and stuff like that. So it changes the days around. And that's why many times uh, uh, Easter jumps around. Sometimes it's in March. Sometimes it's in April, you know, and things like that. So, but the Jewish people have 30 days. And there is, there is a couple of times there's changes. Uh, but what happened was, uh, this was in 1977. And I was at L.A. City College. And so I went to class. I was taking Hebrew. And I went to class. And when I got to class, there was no instructor. And so for a week... No instructor showed up, no instructor showed up, no instructor. Every day we'd go there, that was my first class. I was getting there early in the morning. Now, I was driving all the way and riding the bus all the way from Compton to uh, uh, L.A. City, which is right below Sunset, you know, which is almost in Hollywood. So that's a long bus ride and a long drive with all the traffic in L.A. So I was doing this every day, and we'd get there, and there was no instructor. And so, so, you know, we were going to the office. I mean, all of us were, basically, if you want to use the word, we were all Gentiles uh, and trying to take some Hebrew. And so we didn't know what was going on. We were trying to figure out what in the world. And so, uh, and even, now, I don't know if this was the first year they had offered the class or what, because when we went to the office, they didn't know what was going on. And so uh, the next week, you know, we came back. We said, hey, we take a stab at it. We went to the class. Here was the instructor. And so, you know, our first question was, hey, uh, you know, what happened? You know, you weren't here last week. He said it was Rosh Hashanah. Is a very, very, uh, uh, you know, very uh, sacred uh, feast you know, in my culture, you know, and we were like, oh, okay. And he said, yeah, he said, we, we do no work. We do, you know, we, you know, you, you read the scriptures where it said they would do no servile work. He said, we don't work. We don't, you know, we worship. <laughs> and so that was actually, from that time I had studied a year. Uh, I had been saved a little bit over a year at that time because I got saved in 1976. So I had been saved a little bit over a year. This was September of 77. So I had never heard of Rosh Hashanah. Didn't know anything about any Jewish holidays or nothing like that. 
you know, didn't know Passover, none of that, even though I read the Bible. And so that was my first introduction uh, to the Jewish holidays. Uh, still, I studied the Bible for years and years and years. And, and so it was really uh, eye-opening when, I, I forget how, what happened, but uh, it kind of made me think, you know, uh, I know what it was. When I was taking some classes, I was taking some classes around 90, 1995, I think it was. And, uh, you know, I'd been studying the Bible for years. And in the class, it was a class on hermeneutics. And I took that class, and what happened was in that class, you know, uh, hermeneutics, in, which means the interpretation of scriptures. And so when I took that class, you know, there was a lot. And one thing that stuck in my mind that the instructor continued to say was when you read the Bible, uh, what, you know, you know how we put our little spin on it, little interpretation or whatever on the Bible. And uh, he was saying, well, what, first the thing you have to find out is what did it mean to them, to the people that it was written to, not your prophetic not your, you know, the Lord told me and, and the Spirit spoke to me. Not any of that. What did it mean to the Corinthians that Paul is writing to? The Galatians, the Hebrews, the, the you know, uh, 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 when John is first and second John and the different writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, when they were writing to these people, what did it mean to the people that they were writing to first? What was the author trying to convey? You know, then, after you know that, then you can put your, you know, okay, well, what it means to me today. And not before that. And so what it meant, what it, what it made me do was it made me go back and study and start. And then I, the other thing that Bishop Noel Jones would always say is he would say like James, the writer of the book of James, he would say he wrote in Greek, you know, because all of us, every pastor knows that the New Testament was written in Greek. But uh, he, he would say he wrote in Greek, but he thought in Hebrew because he was still a Jew. And the Jews thought in Hebrew. They thought according to their customs, according to everything. He said, but he wrote in Greek. So what that did, and then I got a book, couple of books, and they went into the history and the things of the, of the Jewish, you know, and idioms that Jewish people would say and stuff like that. So what I found out, and all I'm saying is that I start digging into, uh, you know, the Old Testament. I was already... Always called, they used to call me the Old Testament prophet. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, I was always intrigued by the Old Testament. Uh, and, and so, you know, to get an understanding, because what Paul did was Paul basically, he's the one that mainly interpreted a lot of the Old Testament into the New Testament because uh, he was, uh, you know, renowned, uh, sat at the feet of Gamaliel who was one of the greatest doctors of the law at that time. He sat at his feet. He was, a, a, you know, he said a Pharisee and a Pharisee. He said, touching the law. You know, I was a Pharisee. Talking about, he, you know, uh, he was uh, exceeding zealous for the tradition of his father. He was very serious about studying uh, what we know today as Judaism, but of course, which was known at that time, uh, you know, was what the Jews and the one God. So, what I'm saying is that, so it, it gave me a yearning to understand better what was said to the people of God, you know, when they wrote things and uh, what they were saying. And so what it also did was it made me, uh, as I started studying, uh, I had different instructors that, you know, began to talk about feast days. And of course, I thought feast days, you know, they didn't mean anything to me. But I want to share with you is that they do mean something. Why? Because when you look at the Word of God and you see the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Passover was uh, the day that Jesus died. Why did he die on Passover? 
because he was our Passover lamb. Paul says he was our Passover lamb. He died on Passover. That's why he could say, your time is always ready, but my time is not at hand. Because he knew what day he must die. He must die on Passover. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was right actually the 14th of the month of, of uh, uh, Nisan, as they call it. The 14th of Nisan was Passover. The 15th of Nisan was Unleavened Bread. At that time, he was in the grave. And then that year was the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits. And then, and then Paul, again, interpreting scripture, says in the book of Corinthians, he is the first fruits of them that slept. So he rose on the Feast of First Fruits, which was the first day of the week. So every one of those feasts meant something. So now, and then we learned that in the Hebrew, when he says it in, in the book of uh, Leviticus, I haven't even went to the scripture, I'm going to go to Leviticus, when he says the scripture, you know, I'll go there now, hallelujah, I was going to wait a minute, but I'm going to go there now, because I, I, I wanted to get to the other scripture I was going to actually uh, lead off with, but I'll go there now, uh, and go to Leviticus, it's Leviticus 23, so you can follow along with me. Uh, Leviticus 23. Now I'm definitely going to need the specs. Here's what it says. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to, the holy, to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, uh, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy, holy convocation. You should do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in your dwelling. Then he says, these are the feasts. Okay. Now, what that feast, when it says, uh, speak unto the children of Israel uh, concerning the feast of the Lord, that Hebrew word means the appointed times. Appointed times. Those times are appointed. What? For there? Yes. But also for future. Because Jesus was going to be our Passover lamb. So he had to die on Passover. He would be in the grave for three days and three nights. I tell you, my friend, I know there's dissension. You know, people say, oh, no. Yeah, three days and three nights, he was in the grave. I'll let you deal with that, you know. But he was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then on that Sunday, the first day of the week, he rose. Paul said he was the first fruits of them that slept. He was the first fruits of them that slept. Of course, all of Pentecost, because we're Pentecostal, because we're apostolic, because we're, uh, what, what do you call it, uh, not evangelical, I won't say that word, but a lot of people that speak in tongues, all of us just about know about Pentecost. So what does God use Pentecost for, which is another feast day? He uses 50 days after Passover is Pentecost, and he uses that day for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Again, fulfilling. Why? That was the day. Now, they took Pentecost and said that was the day that the law was given. So now here comes the new. The Holy Ghost infilling men and women. Oh, God. It's like he said the law, he would... They would no longer be on stone. They'd be written in our hearts. So when the Holy Ghost came inside us, the Holy Ghost has the law written on the inside. My God, it's awesome. God's word, that's why we know God's word is true. Because what the, the Jewish people taught us, uh, according to uh, uh, Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah, was... To interpret the Bible, you got to have line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. That's the way you interpret. What they do is they take, and what the Apostle Paul did was he takes, you take a word, a word, and you follow that word all the way 
So when you look at trumpets, which we're talking about the feast of trumpets, we haven't got there yet, but we're talking about it. Because today, actually, we are in the middle of the Feast of Trumpets. Of course, it started in Israel 10 hours ago. You know, they're 10 hours different from us. So, in Jerusalem. So, not it didn't start 10 hours ago, but I'm saying it started at 6 in the evening. You know, people made a pilgrimage because it's one of those, it's one of those, uh, some people have made a pilgrimage uh, to Jerusalem. In fact, uh, I was listening to the news and they were saying, one guy was saying that he had come from somewhere else and he had come to Jerusalem, for, you know, because of the, the holiday, because of Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. And, you know, they were being bombarded by uh, Iran, which shoot missiles at Israel. You know, hallelujah. They would bunker down in, in the bunkers and stuff uh, because they were being shot at uh, by Iran, you know. So, I mean, you know, all this lets us know, and this is, that's why the Feast of Trumpets is so important as well. All it lets us know is that the end is near as far as the end, end time. We're in end times, you know. Uh, and, 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 and when you teach on end times, people get afraid. You don't have to be afraid if you know Jesus. See, that's the thing. If you know the Lord, you don't have to be afraid of anything. Fear not, little fly. But it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And he loves giving people the kingdom. He loves people being saved. He loves, amen, you being sanctified. And he loves you being loved by him and you loving him. So you don't have to be afraid. You know, when you know what you know that you know. And the main thing is that you know him. Hallelujah. When you know the Lord, see, this, you know, fear. You know, many times in the book of Revelation, fear, it said, and fear overcame them. And, you know, that's that's the world. That's the world. It's not like that for us because we know already uh, what God is doing. So, again, as I said, we're talking about uh, the Feast of Passover was his death. Unleavened bread, him lying in the grave three days and three nights. Feast of uh, first fruits, him rising from the dead the first day of the week. Hallelujah. Pentecost. When Pentecost comes, here comes the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Uh, and the Holy Ghost has filled us. Now his law is in our hearts. Hallelujah. It's not just on stone. It's in our hearts. The Holy Ghost is in us. Christ in us is the hope of glory now. Hallelujah. We have God on the inside. Bless the Lord. Get me excited up in here. So we're talking about appointed times. The feasts of the Lord are appointed times. They have they had a, a, a meaning for then, and they have meaning for now. And the meaning for now is they are being fulfilled. Okay. So those three, four were fulfilled. So now, what do you have left? You have Rosh Hashanah which is the Feast of tr uh, Trumpets, or they call it the New Year, you know, and I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. You know, they call it the New Year, because uh, that's actually, here's what it says. He says, uh, uh, here's the scripture that we were reading, it's 23, 23 through, through 25 of Leviticus. It says, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. On the first day of the appointed month, in the early autumn, you are to observe a day of complete rest, and it will be an official day, a holy assembly, a day commemorated with loud blasts of a trumpet. You must do no ordinary work on that day. Instead, you are to present special gifts to the Lord. So, Rosh Hashanah literally means the head of the year, but biblically, it is much more than that. In the book of Leviticus in Hebrew, it is actually referred to as Yom HaTorah, the day of the blowing of trumpets or the ram's horn. Or, I you know, many of us, we've heard the shofar. That's the ram's horn. That they were, ooh, you know, you saw the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, when Moses said, when Joshua asked Moses, are you ready to go? He said, yeah, tell everybody, let's get ready. And all of a sudden, Joshua was like, ooh, he blew the shofar. <laughs> well, I got to relate to movies because a lot of us saw the movies. Everything in the movies is not true, but, you know, you can relate to certain things, you know. Uh, so, yeah, so the day of the blowing of the trumpets. It says the piercing blast of the shofar is meant to remind the hearers. Here's, now, here's what's powerful. Uh, because it is in Rosh Hashanah, it's the new year. 
this is their new year. Because it is the new year, here's what they want to do. It says, it reminds the hearer to repent for his sins and make things right with his brothers and sisters. The rabbis say that the reconciliation between God and man will confound the enemy. Isn't that powerful? It will confound the enemy. Hallelujah. That's what Rosh Hashanah... In other words, just like we... And it's the same thing almost, you know, because... We don't look at it as a religious, you know, thing when we look at January 1st, you know. We don't look at that as religious, but this is something that the whole nation will look at. This is a time, you know, many times January 1st, we look at it as a time that we can, uh, you know, make resolutions and all those kind of things. I want to be different. I want to, you know, do some different things in my life. I want to start a business. I want to, you know, I want to do this. I want to get married, all kind of, you know. Uh, all these things that we say, well, this is a time that the Jewish people get together, hallelujah, and they make, in a sense, resolutions. But the main resolution is to God. Not so many carnal resolutions, not so many uh, uh, just worldly resolutions. I want to start this, I want to do this, you know, but it is a commitment to God. I repent. I repent to my brothers and sisters. I repent to my God. Hallelujah. I repent to my great God, the God of heaven. Hallelujah. I repent to him, number one, because I want to start anew. Even though we know it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. His compassion fails not. They are new every morning. And great is his faithfulness. Hallelujah. We know every day we can repent. But this is a time that the nation of Israel would take time out as this feast day started and they would repent for their sins and they call on God, hallelujah, as they looked at Rosh Hashanah, they would call on God and they blow the shofar because it was a remembrance for them that they would repent. Look at that, what he said. Hey, look at what he said, hallelujah. Oh, he said, he says here, he said, the piercing blast of the shofar is meant to remind the hearer to repent for his sins and make things right, not only with God, that's number one, but with your brothers and sisters. Oh, my God. We have to make things right with our brothers and sisters. We cannot hold grudges. We cannot hold animosities in our heart. We cannot do it. And, it, you know, like he says, you know, when, 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 <laughs> when Peter asked the question, how many times must I forgive my brother? And Jesus says 70 times 70. 70 times 7. You know, that's 490. But he was talking about the unlimitedness of forgiveness. Because God forgives you. You know, within the, the what we call the Lord's Prayer, he says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive who? Our debt ours. Or forgive us our trespasses as we forget those, forgive those who trespass against us. And that's one thing that we got to, as the children of God, we have to do. We got to forgive one another. We got to get it right, you know, between our brothers and our sisters because it's the right thing to do. It's because God, for Christ's sake, forgave us. Isn't that powerful? He forgave. God forgave us for our foolishness. For our, some of us just had a hatred. And God forgave us. You know, I can look at myself, and like I said, when I've told you many times, those of you who have, you know, been part of our congregation, those of you, you know, uh, over the years, you know, you say the same thing over and over and over again. You know, but I'm saying I wouldn't go to church even on Easter. That was like a slap in, in the face of the Lord. Why? Because that was a time I probably could have got something from God. I probably could have got saved. But I didn't go. I didn't put myself out like that. Hallelujah. I didn't go to those, you know, I didn't do it. Because I said at that time I didn't want to be a hypocrite. But that's not what it's about. You know, what it's about is that I should have went because it was a time to honor 
the Lord. It was a time to honor the Lord, so I didn't go. But once I got saved and understood what it was about and what Easter was, you know, see, so that's what I'm saying is that it is a time to renew, renew, hallelujah, renew your acquaintance with God, a time to renew your acquaintance with your brothers and sisters, renew, get rid of the junk. Get rid of all the junk that you have in your heart against people. Uh, you know, people have done you wrong. People have done all of us wrong. <laughs> I don't think anybody living to a certain age, if you've gotten to 30 years of age, you've been done wrong by somebody. You know, but you got to forgive them and move on. Because what happens is, and, and psychologists have told us this over and over and over again, what happens is it hurts you more than them. Many times people have gone on with their lives and they have forgot they even did something to you. You know, and so you're dredging, you're going through with it, you're hurting and everything, and those people are skipping, you know, as we say with Tiny Tim, skipping through the tulips and don't care anything about what you're dealing with. So it's better just to go ahead and forgive them and move on. Move on, move on, move on. Hallelujah. So at this time, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about now. Uh, it is about a time as we go into the Feast of Trumpets. And, and see, there's now there's that meaning, and I'm going to go into the next meaning of it as well. You know, because again, remember we said every uh, uh, feast day uh, so far, you know, Passover, Unleavened bread, uh, uh, feast of first fruits, and Pentecost has been fulfilled. So, now one thing I'll tell you is that according to Zechariah, the feast of Tabernacles, which is actually coming up in uh, probably about, uh, uh, I think it's in the month of, it, I don't know, it might be in the end of October or the first of November. The Feast of Tabernacles is coming, and that feast will be fulfilled in the millennium, according to Zechariah. It's in the millennium. We're going to come up every year to serve God in the Feast of Millennium, uh, at the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. It says, according to Zechariah, we're going to come up every year, and we're going to serve God. We're going to come and be before him in the temple of God. Uh, during the millennium. So but so that leaves a couple of things. The Feast of Trumpets and that leaves Ra I mean not Rosh Hashanah. That leaves Yom Kippur which is in a few days coming up. Yom Kippur, Kippur is the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. And I'll tell you right now the Day of Atonement, I could deal with that next week but I'll tell you right now that the Day of Atonement is uh, going to be fulfilled during the seven years of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, amen, the time that we're going to have that we will be in glory, receiving our rewards, hallelujah, but the earth will be going through hell, uh, because that's going to be the time of the Antichrist, the time of the false prophet, the time, you know, of all the, you look at the different seals that are going to be opened and all that, during that seven years of tribulation. During those times, that is the day of atonement. Because remember, you're talking about seven years. Hallelujah. Seven years. This is going to go on. And it's going to start. That's why, you you know, that's why we always say we're catching some heat now. Because we're getting ready to get out of here. <laughs> getting ready to get out of here. So we're catching heat now. You know. Not so much in America, but even in America. You go out there and preach. Preach and teach truth. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about foolishness and you can do what you want to do and be saved. No, I'm, I'm teaching holiness. Teaching walking with God. Righteousness. Teaching, you know, against all this foolishness going on in this world that people are sancti uh, sanctioning and saying it's all right. You know, do you, you know, like the, the Wisely brothers used to say, do your thing. You know, it's your thing. Do what you want to do. Well, that's what people are doing. But that's not godly. That's not, I can't help it. 
That's not godly. You know, and as a church, you know, it's been difficult for us to deal with it. You know, we try to figure out how do we love things, or love, well, not things, love people, even though they're doing things that we know are not, are not godly. Well, I think you have to relate it like this, because of the things I was doing weren't godly either. You know, though I wasn't, you know, with a lot of the things that's going on today, I mean, I was smoking, I was getting high, I was getting drunk, I was doing all those kind of things. Those things are not godly, you know. So, uh, the same thing, but God still loved me, and people, I guess, still love me enough to care about me, to show me the gospel. The gospel saves people, folks. The gospel. I ain't nothing more powerful than the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ will take a murderer and turn him into a lamb, a meek man of God or woman of God. That's what the gospel can do. I have seen it over and over and over. I have seen men that were killers, hallelujah, men that would, would do any abominable thing to anybody. And I've seen God change them by his power through the gospel. That's why Paul said that it is the power of God. <laughs> he said in 116 of Romans, it is the power of God unto salvation. And he does use that word there, not exousia, which means authority. He uses the word uh, 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 that means dynamite, dunamis. It is the dunamis power. It is the dunamis of God, the power of God. God changes men and women. Hallelujah. Oh, can't nobody do you like Jesus. See, that's the difference. That's the difference. See, that's the difference. People, you know, they oh, man, you know, you in that old religion and all that. See, they don't understand. See, it's not about religion. It's about a change that God has done. Hallelujah. God changed my life. See, you can, you can say all you want to about that. I know what he did for me. See, you can go, <laughs> you can tell your story whatever way you want to. You can tell me all about your books. You can tell me all about the civilizations that was here way back when and, all, you know, in millions of years. You can tell me all that stuff you want to. And I can tell you one thing is God saved my life. God saved me. Hallelujah. And I can tell you that because he did it for me. I'm not talking about what he did for somebody else. I'm talking about what he did for me. Hallelujah. That's why. I don't even get, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 get upset, you know, because I have people even on this platform, people on this platform even, you know, uh, uh, you know, they pushing, I mean, you know, black nationalism, all the stuff people push, push on. But you can't tell me what I got is not real because he did it to, for me. Hallelujah. Oh, if it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, when you have a personal experience with God, see, people can't take that. You know, they can, they can talk about the way, your personal experience. See, that's why God said in the Word of God, He says in the Gospels, you know, when he said, they said, oh, we've, we've cast out devils in your name. We've, we've, you know, we've done this and we've done that. And he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I know you not. And that Greek word, we've said it before, is gnosko, which means we don't have experience together. See, but when you have had an experience with God, it's different. <laughs> My God, it's different. When you have had an experience. You want to serve him. You want to love him. You want to do his will. When you have an experience with God, when God has done something for you, picked you up, turned you around. <laughs> My God. See, the thing is, people haven't been touched with the power of God yet. 
see, because I know what he'll do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know what God will do. I was telling you a few weeks ago, I had a friend, guy got saved, uh, was one of the new members, and this guy was flying all over the country, private jets, uh, uh, doing cocaine. No, he wasn't doing it. He was selling it, you know. He was in private jets and all this, and God saved him. God saved him. And I mean, he saved him to where this brother gave all that up. And brother was like bumming money. He was a brother that had, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in his pocket, you know, all the time. And he went to nothing for the sake of his soul. <laughs> Don't tell me what God can't do. Hallelujah. You know, I know people. I know people. I'm one. But I know people who God has saved. You know, I remember Bishop telling and I knew the brother. You know, Bishop said that one guy was a pimp. And he was pimping out the women. And said, and one of the women that was with him said he came to the church and got saved. And one of the ladies that was one of his, you know, girls, she got saved too. And they got married. Had ministry all over the country. I know what God can do. Song says there is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Hallelujah. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Roshokota said. Hallelujah. I've been to the meeting one night. My soul wasn't right. Something got a hold to me. And I know what it was. It was the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost got a hold. Honey, the Holy Ghost will change you, turn you around, make you a different person. All the hatred in your heart. God will change that. You'll love. <laughs> Woo, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. But I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to tell you, the word of God is right. My bishop used to say, said, <laughs> he said, God is right. Somebody's wrong. Hallelujah. Because all this other stuff people are saying that don't line up with God's word. Don't line up with his word. So if it doesn't line up with his word, it's wrong. That's what I get from Judge Judy. Judy, Judy, Judy say, I've heard her say it over and over. She said, if people, if you can't understand it, you know, or you can't. <laughs> she said, you know, it, it, it's not true. See, the word is simple. He said, uh, even a wayfaring man can understand it. The word is simple for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah, there are some deep, deep parts in the Bible. It just takes some learning. It takes some understanding. But it's all not deep. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's very simple. He said, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That it might be saved. Bible says, you know, said men would come and, and men would be uh, 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 saying, well, where is the sign of his coming? You know, where he said scoffers would come. That's what he called them. Scoffers. He said, where is the sign of his coming? Y'all been talking about Jesus coming for years. He said, but God, amen, who is merciful, God, he said, who is unwilling that any should perish, he has prolonged those days because he's not willing that any should perish. He trying, he's prolonging it. Every time he, he might think, ah, I should come on back. Let's end it all. And he thinks about that little old lady that needs to be saved. He thinks about that young brother who's out there Amen. Still selling drugs. He thinks about that old brother over there who's still beaten and being abusive. And he says, well, I've got a few more people I've got to save. And so he's unwilling that any should perish. And so he delays again his coming. He delays it. But when he comes, according to this scripture, 
as we have talked about the different ones that have already been fulfilled. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says, and we're going to turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Hallelujah. Chapter 4. He says, verse number 13, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have died in Christ. Don't worry about them. Don't, 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 don't look at it. You know, don't worry about them. Because he, he, he's going to tell you what, what's going on. He says, but that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This is not Paul's and now. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Uh, the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But notice he said, uh, at the trump, the trumpet shall sound. Again, he says it in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He talks about it the last trump. The trumpet, the feast of trumpets goes along just like the other four were fulfilled. The feast of trumpets will be fulfilled when that trump sounds. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just like we said about the day of atonement during the tribulation period. And of course, the feast of, of tabernacles will be during the millennium. So, Every feast day is being fulfilled. Those that have not been fulfilled will be fulfilled. Why? Because according to Leviticus 23 and 1, they are called appointed times. They're called appointed times. They are times that something is going to happen. Hallelujah. And I just, just because I said it, you know, don't make it true. So I want to... Uh, to, to go to that scripture I was saying to you, I said, uh, I was saying to you about, oh, that's, get that off. Okay, uh, I'm going to read that for you. Yeah, here, here's what he says. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 51. Here's what he says. Behold, I show you a mystery. Hallelujah. And this mystery is only for you and I. You and I, the church, the people of God, the body of Christ. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We should not all sleep. Now remember, sleep was used again in that other scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4. So again, he's talking about sleep. So what is he talking about? Those that have slept and are now sleep in Christ. Those that have died. Those that have gone on before us. Amen. He says, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last what? Trump. At the last trump. Last trumpet. Same thing. Again, putting the words together. Trumpet here, First Corinthians, I mean First Thessalonians chapter four, verse sixteen, the trump of God shall sound. The trump. You know, it's the same thing. And what are we celebrating today? The feast of trumpets. So three feasts are left unfulfilled. The feast of trumpets at his coming. Atonement, Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement. Seven years of tribulation and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is during the tribulation. Those are the three that have not yet been fulfilled, but they will be fulfilled just like the other four were. 
The other four have already been fulfilled. Passover, he was our Passover lamb. He died on Passover. Unleavened bread, he was in the grave. Three days, three nights. The first feast of first fruits, he rose from the dead. The first fruits of them that slept. Pentecost, the day the Holy Ghost came. God set it up. They are appointed time. God knows exactly what he's doing. He says in Leviticus, these are the appointed times. These are the feasts of the Lord. The appointed times of the Lord. I've appointed them to be fulfilled and they will be fulfilled. What does that tell us? That just tells you that the word of God is right. The word of God is right. And like I said, Bishop say somebody's wrong. <laughs> okay, let me read this. He said, a ram's horn is used as a traditional shofar because when Abraham showed his willingness to sacrifice his son, amen, Isaac, God provided a ram in the thicket to be used in his place. And of course, that right there, another, another prophecy. When he said, he said, well, you know, uh, uh, Isaac said to his father, he said, father, you know, the, the uh, wood is here. He said everything's set and everything. He said, but where is the sacrifice? And then what did, What was the words of Abraham? His word, that words of Abraham were, the Lord will provide a sacrifice. He was on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is Mount Calvary. When did the Lord provide the sacrifice on Mount Calvary? On Golgotha's hill, when the sacrifice, not of Abraham's son, but of God's son was done. Again, prophecy being fulfilled. It's being fulfilled all the time. God said, he is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he spoken, shall he not make it good? He's going to do it every time. He never failed. And I don't even say yet. You know, it used to be a song when I got saved. He never failed me yet. He never failed me yet. Jesus Christ Never fail me yet. You know, but we don't say yet. Because he's not going to fail. And I, well, hallelujah. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, it is impossible for God to lie. That's why I just told you, God is not a man that he should lie. Men lie. God doesn't lie. Why? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the truth. Told us in the 17th chapter of John, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. That's what we're dealing with today. The word of God. And it's coming to pass all the time. He keeps doing great things for me. Yes, he does. Why? Because he's God. And he does not lie. Oh, bless his name. I have never seen him lie. I've been walking this way, uh, you know. And, and I've messed up, I've fallen, I've, I've scraped my arm, scraped my knee, you know, and all those kind of things. But he has never failed me. I am about to say, yeah, he's never failed me. He's never gone back on a promise. Sometimes you just got to wait. He told Abraham, you're going to have a child. 25 years later, he had a child. When tomorrow. Wasn't nine months from the time he said it. It was 25 years. Sometimes God speaks, and it's coming. But it's in the future. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Bless his name. Bless his name. I could give a testimony of when God called me, said I was going to be the uh, youth leader at Greater Bethany. You know, when he called me, I never thought much. Of, I mean, not that I didn't think much about it. I said like this: when he called me, I was already assistant youth leader. I was the vice president of the youth department at the time, so it was nothing if if Pastor Horn had moved on that I would be the next. But see, uh, that's the way I thought. But see, what God did or allowed to be done was after that. Uh, I got sick. I, was, I wasn't even at church for three and a half years. I was out of it completely. They flew somebody in from across the country who never even heard my name, didn't know who I was from Adam. <laughs> uh, 
So now, God says, I'm going to show you who I am. Because you looking at it like, oh, it's an easy thing to happen. But now I done put you over here, and they don't even know you. Now how you going to be you to live? But see, God, to make a long story short, he worked it out. He worked it out. He did it. And next thing I know, 1990, now, that was in 1978, 79, when God told me that. But 1990, 91, is when I became a youth leader at Greater Bethlehem. It's a little time between the two, <laughs> you know. Uh, but even I was working for the pastor, for the church, and, and still didn't know whether that prophecy would come to pass. But God has a way. Hallelujah. He is not a man that he should lie. Hallelujah. I love what the, well, the writer, they said, many say it wasn't the Apostle Paul, but whoever the writer of Hebrews was. And I love when he says, Two immutable promises. <laughs> he said, in that it was impossible for God to lie. Oh, my God, impossible. If he told you something and God told you something, it's going to happen. I don't care what they say. If God, God promised these people, Jesus told us in the 24th chapter of Matthew, I believe it's the 21st chapter of Luke, and I think in, in Mark, it's the like 15, well, about the 14th chapter, he talked about what would happen at the end times, and we are seeing those things today. Wars, rumors of war, you know. But he told us that the key to the end times, and that's why he told us that the key to the end times would be Israel. He said, when you see them trampled over by the Gentiles, when you see what's going on in Israel, he said, look up, for your redemption draws nigh. When you see Israel, see, there were some things that had to happen. You know, one was Israel had to become a nation again. It was not a nation since A.D. 70. A.D. 70, and then God Almighty in the book of Isaiah. That was almost a thousand, well, it wasn't a thousand, about six, seven hundred years before Christ. Isaiah wrote, shall a nation be born in one day? <laughs> Israel was born in one day. They were nothing the day before, and the next day they were a nation in 1948. Oh, bless God. God has never lied. My God. That's why, you know, I love history. I love history because of the Bible. I didn't care nothing about history in school. But when I start studying the Word, it, it just did something to me when I start studying. So, yeah, it says, Shalom, I believe it's around chapter 58, somewhere in there, if you want to look it up. Shall a nation be born in a day? Israel was born in a day. So now, from 48, the countdown of the end time starts. Because first of all, there wasn't a nation yet. It had to be a nation before you can uh, uh, look at it being trampled and all that, and then look up for your redemption draws nigh. Had to be a nation first. Now it's a nation. 1948 it became a nation. You, oh, oh, bless God. 67 war, six day war they called it. There was probably four or five different nations, Arab nations that fought Israel. They beat them in six days. Bam! Because of God. Anwar Sadat came against Israel in 1973. The Egyptians, they whooped them. That's when Anwar Sadat said, you know what? I'm going to make peace with Israel. That's why they killed him. Anybody that was a sympathizer with Israel, Israel has enemies all around it. They were, I mean, you had, you had Jordan, which is another nation. You had Jordan, you had Iran, you got Iraq. All these are Arab nations all around Israel, and they hate Israel. 
And the crazy thing is they hate one another or hate is ruined. And I'm sure there's hate on both sides. They hate one another and yet they're relatives. Because <laughs> Abraham had two sons. One was Isaac, of which we know he says in, in Isaac shall your seed be called the Jewish nation. Israel came out of Isaac. But out of Ishmael came the Arabs. So they both came from Abraham. <laughs> yeah, they both came from the same person. Cousins, if you believe that. I mean, well, I mean, not if you believe that, but it's true. They both came out of Abraham. These two warring nations, or nations, because uh, Israel is just one nation, and then you got like I say, you got Jordan, you got, you know, uh, <laughs> Saudi Arabia, you know, you got uh, uh, Iran, Iraq, all of these are Arab nations that hate Israel. Iran just got through uh, 200 ballistic missiles they sent to Israel. <laughs> they just did that. Hallelujah. So, I'm saying that's our timekeeper. It is the Feast of Trumpets. That feast, of course, is seven days. On the eighth day is what they call a Sabbath, a Sabbath, where the you know where they have no, they don't work. They don't. Now notice, there's two Sabbaths. See, one Sabbath is every Saturday. Saturday is the Sabbath. That's the seventh day of the week. But then there's, when they have feasts, there's a Shabbat at the end of that feast, on the eighth day of the feast. And again, you look at Luke 20, uh, Le uh, Leviticus 23, and you'll see that every time they have a feast, at the end of that feast, there is a Shabbat. It's not Saturday, but it's a Shabbat. It's a Sabbath. It's a day of rest. Whether it's on a Wednesday or Tuesday or Monday, it doesn't matter. It is a time of rest. Now, I'm tying this in as I close right now. That's important. You know why it's important? Because when the Bible talks about the Shabbat drew closer, when Jesus was on the cross, they took him down because they didn't want him, you know, to be on the cross in the Shabbat. It's not that Shabbat. It's not Saturday. I know people say Jesus died on Friday. No, it's not that Shabbat. It's the Shabbat of the feast day. You know what? I believe this. I'm trying to think of this Mark who says it, it was a high day. What high day means, it was a holy day, it was a feast day. So when you line up on line, precept on precept, you know that when they're talking about the Sabbath drew near, they're not talking about Saturday. They're talking about the Sabbath of the feast day. And they treated it just like the Sabbath of the Saturday. Oh, bless it. You know, I, I'm saying when you study truth, you know, that's why when Jesus made the statement that the Son of Man would be in the earth, you know, I ain't going to tell you nothing, but I'm going to show you the sign of Jonah. Where Jonah said, you know, he was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights. He said, so shall the Son of Man be in the earth. He wasn't jiving. It was true. That's exactly how long he was there. He wasn't there two days, one day and a half. He was there three days and three nights in the earth. And on the first day of the week, he got up just like the scriptures say. Hallelujah. My brothers, my sisters, have a great feast of trumpets. Rosh Hashanah, it's a time to get your life right with God. Get right with your brothers and sisters. If you got arts going on, it's time to squash them. If you got beefs, squash them. You know, we got all these, you know, different people. Uh, I hear about, you know, because of social media, 
I don't even know the people, but you know, people they got beefs with one another, rappers and stuff like that. This is the time that we squash that and go to God. And if you got a beef with the Lord, you squash that too and say, Lord, forgive me. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to be saved. Hallelujah. I want to be delivered. I want to be set free by the power of God. I tell you what, he, has, he doesn't want anything more better for you than that. He wants to set you free. Hallelujah. He doesn't want you plagued by sin. He doesn't want you plagued by any other thing. He wants you to be set free by the power of God. So, my brothers, my sisters, tomorrow night is our prayer. I know my good brother, uh, my friend, amen, from way back in the day, in the days of Compton, uh, Champ, he was asking about our prayer. Our prayer is at 6 o'clock uh, tomorrow afternoon, amen, 6 o'clock, the number is 605-475-2090, and the access code is 1453. 769. We pray from 6 o'clock to 6.30. We're not on there all night. We pray that long. And if you don't want to pray, but you want to submit a prayer request, you can direct message me here. Amen. Or the Garden of Peace Worship Center. We have two Facebook pages. We have one that you can join, or we have one that, of course, you can like. Uh, we have both. So, uh, amen. So, with that being said, I'm through for tonight. Amen. Next week, maybe we'll talk about the Day of Atonement, because it will be right around that time. Amen. As we say, done. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. May God richly bless you, my brothers and my sisters, in Jesus' name. God bless you. We love you.